Today we acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Ojibwe peoples, and on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe and Ottawa Saga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of Indigenous people whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. I will look to the Deputy Mayor for the motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, the agenda. And uh, the motion is that the content of the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee agenda for September 9, 2020 be adopted as amended. And the uh, amendments are uh, one up item updated, 4.2 CAO 2020-7, Delegation of Powers and Duties by a law. September 9, 2020, and number two, attachment and recommendation added 5.3, initial 2021 budget discussion and expectations and proposed motion, uh, CAO Skinner dated September 9, 2020. Are there, Councillor, any questions or comments before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the agenda? That is carried unanimously, thank you. And uh, declarations of pecuniary interest. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest today, Council? Seeing none, if you find yourself in that situation as we get through the agenda, please let us know. Uh, so uh, under item four, staff reports. Item 4.1 is the auditor's report, 2019 financial statements. And I understand we have Sue Bragg, uh, partner from Baker Tilly SGB LLP to present to us today. Here's that Sue is with us. So if she can unmute her uh, audio and her video, that would be great. Sue, are you able to hear that and to join us? See, Sue is here. It looks like her audio should be working. could chair I could mention to Sue that there's a little arrow on the bottom of the screen near the microphone where one could choose from uh, several microphones should you happen to have more than one on your computer okay hopefully that's of assistance Sarah, if it's of any assistance to uh, Sue, if uh, she would like us to proceed, we can go to item the next staff report uh, if she uh, is having some issues and needs some time. I think uh, your worship, she might have left and is going to rejoin. Okay. But we can definitely uh, move on to the next one until we get uh, her set up. We'll give her a couple of minutes. Uh, I don't want to get started on the uh, the next item, which is uh, uh, is a lengthy report and is important as well. I don't want to get part way into that and then go back. So we'll give her a couple of minutes, and if we still have issues, then uh, then we'll move on to the second item. I believe we've lost Councillor Comey. Okay. Uh, Chris, maybe you can reach out to Councillor Comey and see if she's having uh, difficulties.
Yeah. Oh, there's Sue. Hello. Hi. Welcome, Sue. I'm, uh, we've got you now online, but I'm going to ask you to pause just for maybe another 30 seconds to see if we can get Councillor Comey back. Um. Excuse me, Your Worship. I just heard from Councillor Comey. She is trying to reconnect at this time. Okay, we'll give her another 30 seconds then. Thanks, Chris. Okay, it looks like we have Councillor Comey back. So welcome, Sue, and I will uh, give you the floor. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about the delay. I didn't realize until everyone started talking that I didn't have any sound on my laptop. So I had to make a quick change to the uh, to my iPad. Um, technology is wonderful. So in your agenda packages, you received a copy of the draft financial statements. Um, and as in prior years, the draft financial statements were prepared by your very own treasury staff. We have simply appended our audit report to that and of course gone through everything with a fine tooth comb from spell check to footing to checking every number and every word. Um, so they are available, uh, as I say, as part of the agenda package. Uh, part of the agenda package was also the draft uh, management letter uh, which included a, a point regarding uh, water department inventory. Um, and so um, without further ado, let's move on to the next slide. And as in prior years, it is uh, consolidated, including the library and the BIA figures as well. Uh, we are expecting that, the, uh, that a quorum of council will approve these draft financial statements and thus the audit report is dated September 21st. And it is an unqualified opinion as it has been in prior years. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of the consolidated statement of operations. Uh, that's part of the audited financial statements. And of course, the one line that is always um, has the largest variances when we look uh, compared to both budget and actual is the capital and other revenue line. You can see there that the forecast or the budget was approximately 16 million. Um, uh, actual was under 3 million and uh, last year was about 17 million. So the capital projects are a very tough area to forecast, uh, particularly when it comes to what revenues are going to be associated with those. And, um, and so, you know, not surprisingly, there are some large, uh, large variances there. Another thing to keep in mind is that that line, capital and other revenues, last year's 2018 figure includes $10.5 million related to the gain on sale of hydro utility, as well as $6.1 million for contributed tangible capital assets, which was the, largely the assumption of the Mayor Mills subdivision. This year's capital and other revenues includes uh, um, about 2.1 million as the gain on the sale of the airport. Um, as well, there was an adjustment for the uh, contaminated site. So last year, we included an expense of 5 million and there's a further 3 million. So on the balance sheet or the statement of, statement of uh, financial position, you'll note that that liability is now up to an estimated figure of $8 million. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, other variances related to the statement of operations, uh, net municipal uh, taxation increased approximately 1.3 million and it was about $700,000 greater than budget. Uh, that's mainly due to supplementary taxes. That is a tough area to uh, estimate. Um, other areas where um, uh, revenues were up were under user charges. 
uh, government transfers, and that was largely the modernization grant that was received, as well as in investment income. There was far better rates received in 2019 uh, than had been uh, either expected in the budget or, or last year. Other revenue is lower, though, uh, because there was about uh, $1.3 million in dividends received from the hydro utility in 2018 that was not, uh, not the case, certainly, of course, in 2019, because the hydro utility had been sold by then. Under expenses, um, in all categories, and this is a, a large variance that we've talked about every year, um, the actual 2019 and the actual 2018 figures do not include amortization expense, uh, but certainly, uh, um, pardon me, do include amortization expense, but that's not included in the annual budget. Of course, when we set our tax rates, uh, we do not include amortization expense, and so that's why it's not included in the budget column. And amortization is very large. Um, in 2019, it approached $11 million. It was $10.8 million compared to $10.7 million last year. Um, and then last but not least, under the expense variances, uh, there was over $5 million spent on the judicial inquiry, and you can see that as an increase over 2018 and, and the budget, both columns uh, under the general government line. Next line, next slide. Um, so the next three pages, uh, the next three slides are actually uh, a pie chart that shows just kind of a snapshot of, of where your revenues uh, come from. So not surprisingly, the largest uh, share of your revenues comes from property taxation. Uh, user charges also make up a significant component. And between the two of those, they're well over three quarters of your uh, total revenues. Next slide. Financial activities. Um, so this is, is breaking down your expenses by the various departments so that you can see there, uh, uh, it's actually fairly uh, evenly weighted between uh, general government protection services and so on. Um, of course, the general government uh, for 2019 is significantly higher, um, as I mentioned earlier, related to the judicial inquiry. So that, that section of the pie wouldn't normally be that large. Next slide. And then last but not least, um, this is looking at your expenses based on, uh, based on what, you know, what the object was. So salaries and benefits um, make up obviously the biggest portion, but also some significant dollars, as I've mentioned before, amortization expense, um, and then contracted services and materials as well. Next slide. This is the, uh, the top section of the Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. So the, the top few lines make up the financial assets. Um, and so this shows your cash and investments and then your other various uh, receivables. And one of the statistics that we look at um, is cash and short-term investments as a percentage of your operating expenses. The, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs publishes um, averages and the provincial average is about 25%. Uh, they consider low risk 10% and we are you know, far and above that at over 100%. There's our cash and investment reserves are very healthy. The next slide. Mm -hmm. Taxes receivable is something else that we look at and uh, the ministry considers anything low risk below 10%, we're, we're actually under 6%, which is right in line with the provincial average. Um, and as you know, we uh, audit seven uh, local municipalities and we find them to be in the four to 10% range. So uh, the town is well within that. Next slide. Accounts receivable uh, were about 6.2 million this year compared to 10 point, almost 10.3 last year. And that's because um, there was a large amount, about $3.2 million outstanding related to the, uh, to the sale of the hydro utility last year. And so that's included in the 2018 figure and of course was paid subsequent to year end and was, was not an issue or part of any of the figures um, at the end of 2019. Um, the other, other reason for the decline is that EPCOR is now billing our water and sewer uh, monthly um, rather than every other month. And so rather than two months of outstanding, that's only a million or sorry, one month that's outstanding. So uh, that improved our position year over year by about 1.1 million at the end of the year. 
Next slide. Long-term receivables. Um, this is up in the $10 million range, and, and previously it had been much lower than that, but part of the... Uh, Part of the EPCOR deal was that um, there were um, several different debt instruments, four in total, that were assumed. And so those appear both under long-term receivables and as part of our long-term debt, because as part of the deal, we had to assume those um, those debt instruments. And, and they are, you know, while, while I know that um, the, uh, that entire amount is really what we need to look at, it's listed in the long-term debt note as four separate debt instruments because, uh, because they are actually are four separate instruments and that's how we have to disclose them. Um, the remaining balance in this $10 million figure is made up of receivables from benefiting landowners for water and sewer servicing that's happened over the last number of years. Next slide. Now, um, this is just a snapshot of the liability um, part of the statement of financial position. And you can see that accounts payable, accrued liabilities, and accrued interest is, uh, is up considerably from last year. Um, and that is because, sorry, I just need to refer to my notes here quickly. Um, at the end of the year, there was about a million dollars in uh, development charges um, owed to the county and the school boards for their share of the DCs. And in 2018, that had been paid prior to year end. This year, um, that wasn't the case at the end of 2019. Um, the other item I want to highlight before we move on, although we will talk, I will talk about it again on a later slide, is that the, li the liability for a contaminated site, so related to the terminals, has increased from $5 million to $8 million um, during 2019. Next slide. Um, this is deferred revenue and obligatory reserve funds. Um, so we have to set these funds aside and therefore on the statement of financial position, they're recorded as a liability. And you can see that the, uh, the Development Charge Act funds increased, you know, about, about $9 million over the course of the year. There were significant additions to de development charges from um, uh, developments such as Eden Oak, uh, La Cranberry Resort, and also the Monaco Development. Next slide. Long-term liabilities. Um, you can see that they there were certainly no long-term new long-term debt taken on during the year, but there were regular repayments made uh, throughout the year. This slide we've also shown the uh, liability for the contaminated site. And one of the um, statistics that we look at is what are your debt service payments as a percentage of revenues. Um, both the provincial average and what the ministry considers low risk is in the 5% neighborhood. Uh, we're up just a little over 8%. And when we calculated that percentage, we did take out the EPCOR related debt because that's really just offset um, between the receivable and the long-term debt. Um, if, that, if those figures were included, um, this percentage would uh, approach 9%. It would be about 8.8%. Next slide. So this is um, the total net financial assets. So if you were to liquidate all of your financial assets and pay off all of your debt, there would be about $34 million remaining in theory. Um, and it's interesting, when the ministry looks at this, um, at net financial assets, they actually expect you to be in a net debt position, which certainly you are not. And so, while I know this shows as negative 100, it's actually a positive thing because they are expecting that you would have net debt of about 50% of your municipal tax levy, when in fact you have net financial assets equal to your municipal tax levy. So it shows kind of funny on the, on the slide, um, but, um, but that, is, uh, that negative 100% is definitely showing you much uh, better than low risk or the provincial average. Next slide. 
Um, tangible capital assets, obviously it's the, the biggest figure on the statement of financial position. So it's a place that we spend a lot of time on. Um, and the, the figure stayed relatively the same year over year. And that just means that the amount that was amortized and the, addition, and the additions to capital assets were roughly the same. And the one ratio that we look at is related to asset consumption ratio. So that is how much of your capital assets have already been consumed or amortized and you're in about the 41% range and low risk is considered 50%. So you're you know, just below uh, what the province considers low risk and pretty much on par with what the provincial average is. If we look at the next slide, we can see um, what uh, the various components of that are. And obviously land shows you know, fully in the green because all of that is remaining. We don't amortize land. It really doesn't, it really doesn't change in value. Um, but you can also see that in the areas of machinery and equipment and vehicles, uh, certainly more has been amortized on those than is the case if you look at buildings or our linear assets. Um, the linear assets include roads, water and sewer lines, sidewalks, um, that sort of thing. Next slide. Um, so just some other disclosures that I wanna make sure that council is aware of when they uh, go through the financial statements. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've all gone through this word for word, but um, just some notes that you wouldn't necessarily see in other municipal statements if you're looking at them. Um, so of course, the one that I've mentioned already is the line liability for the contaminated site um, related to the terminals. Um, also note 19, uh, we've disclosed the commitment and the dollars related to the judicial inquiry. And as I mentioned, those expenses are included on the general government line on the statement of operations. Um, note 20 discloses the details on the sale of the airport. Um, and it calculates um, the overall gain on sale. So you can see in that note um, that the finance staff have detailed, you know, how much was received, how much was spent on, on legal costs, what our original cost was, and the difference between all of those figures is the gain. So not to be confused with what the sale price was or what the cash was that was received, but that for accounting purposes is the gain on the sale of the airport that's detailed in note 20. And then last but not least, note 21, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is a note that we've had to include in all of our all of our assurance uh, financial statements that have been issued um, since March. And so this details uh, what exactly the town has done related to COVID-19. Next slide. So. Um, as I've said before, note 11, the accumulated surplus note is my, is my favorite note. So the town's total accumulated surplus was $245 million at the end of 2019. And that accumulated surplus is made up of, of several different components. And, and keep in mind that the accumulated surplus is the difference between all of your assets and all of your liabilities. It doesn't necessarily represent cash in the bank. Um, and the main reason for that is that, um, you know, a large portion of that uh, $245 million is invested in tangible capital assets. You can see that figure there at $188 million. Um, the current fund surplus is in a negative position, and that is because the liability of $8 million related to the terminals is, is included in that figure. It is broken out in note 11, so it's clear for the reader, but for purposes of this slide, we've grouped it. And then you've got reserves and reserve funds of about $65 million. And again, that's an allocation of your surplus. It doesn't necessarily mean you, that you have that much money in the bank. Um, although, uh, as I mentioned earlier, your cash balances are very, uh, are very healthy. Um, and one of the statistics we look at is reserves as a percent of operating expenses. So the ministry considers anything around 20% low risk. Uh, the provincial average is about 68%. 8%, and we're actually uh, sitting at 107%. 
And this, this next slide uh, details the reserves and reserve funds. Um, you know, many of them, the balances don't change that much from year to year. But if you look under the first line under reserve funds, um, that uh, is the current purposes uh, balance. And it was depleted significantly. There was about $2 million taken uh, from it related uh, and used for the judicial inquiry. Um, and then in contrast, the last line that we see there, the Collis share and airport sales, um, that reserve is a reserve fund is sitting just under 18 million. And it increased during the year, of course, because of the sale of the airport. So in, in closing, um, I want to make mention of a couple of things. So the first is thank you so much to, uh, to Marge and her team uh, for their assistance. I mean, as you can appreciate with having a completely remote audit and all of many of us working from home on certain days, uh, you know, accomplishing the audit was no small feat for, for Marjorie's team or ours for that matter. Um, and so thank you very much for that. Um, also want to uh, take this opportunity to wish Marjorie a, a very long and happy retirement. And last but not least, you know, we're looking very much forward to working with uh, Mike Switzer under his leadership um, in the coming years. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions that anyone may have. Thank you very much for that presentation, Sue. And uh, before we get questions from council, I will ask if there's anyone in our audience who uh, would like to uh, pose any questions or has any comments on the uh, presentation we just received from the auditor. Sarah, do we have anyone who would like to speak to that in our audience? A couple of attendees and anybody wishing to speak, they can either Press the raise your hand feature at the bottom and we will unmute you or you can enter your question in the chat. And it doesn't appear that anybody wishes to speak to this item at this moment. Okay. Then I will look to council. Councillor, are there questions or comments on the presentation we just received? Councillor Hamlin and then Councillor Doherty. Hi. Thank you so much, Sue. That was a great presentation. I like how you pulled out the financial statements and made them into charts and summarized it. So I have just a couple of questions. Um, one, you did a pie chart on uh, device showing how the expenses of the town were divided. And there was one that was almost 22% and you called it environmental. What does environmental mean in that context? Environmental is water and sewer um, mainly. I see. Okay. Yeah. And also, could you just explain why the contingency for the contaminated site, which of course is the terminals, as you mentioned, has increased from 5 million to 8 million? Well, my understanding from talking to finance and looking at the um, at the reports from the uh, from the consultants that had had looked into this was that um, you know, it, it's sounding more and more like the minimum amount that's going to be required to deal with that issue is $8 million. Last year, um, I think there was some thought that something could be done for about $5 million. And so that's why we increased the liability this year. Okay, thank you. Also, um, you showed the amortization of tangible capital assets, which is a bit of a mouthful for me. But as I understand amortization, it's a uh, annual decrease in the value of an asset to show it's reducing value. Do you know how that compares? Like we've heard lots at council meetings before this one about our asset management plans where we're trying to save every year to replace assets because they're wearing. Do these two things relate at all or are they totally separate? Unfortunately, they don't relate because for purposes of the of the audited financial statements, we have to uh, base the cost and therefore the amortization on what they what the purchase price was historically. And of course, with inflation and everything becoming more expensive, there's absolutely no way that the town would be able to replace their existing assets based on the cost that's included in the audited financial statement. So it's I would, I would think, I mean, and I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the asset management plan, but the, the numbers that you would see there would be far higher than what you would see here on the uh, audited statements. 
Okay, and then I just have one other uh, question. You showed a substantial shortfall in capital projects for this year, or for 2019. I think it was in the neighborhood of 20 million. It, does that relate to the extraordinarily high reserves we have for development charges? Is why those numbers, like do they- so I, Yeah, so I think what you're referring to, and, and we had taken a, a snapshot on one of the first slides of all of the sort of other revenues. Um, and you're quite right. There was a large difference between what was budgeted to be, to come from contributions from obligatory reserve funds. Like it was in the neighborhood of about $13 million and only $2 million actually got pulled from those reserves. And that was because projects didn't get completed to the extent that we thought. The other difference between last year and this year was that um, last year included about 10.5 million related to the hydro sale, whereas this year included only two point, just under 2.1 million related to the airport sale. Um, and then the other major variance would be um, last year's capital revenues included over $6 million related to the um, assumption of the Mayor Mills subdivision. And this year there were no new subdivisions assumed. So lots of different factors in there. And that's probably uh, one that you will want to look at on the bottom of the statement of operations to see the various lines because um, lots of different factors affecting that one for sure. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Worship. <clears throat> and this question, it may be for Sue or it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> oh, excuse me maybe for our treasurer uh, <clears throat> excuse me and the oh dear excuse me wow um it's been suggested that um, we could have or um had the option to set up a liability line for the judicial inquiry uh, similar to what we did for the terminals, uh, so that it's showing separate from all of our other expenses, and it also shows, I guess, as an unusual item. Um, is there a particular reason why we did it the way we did it? Um, perhaps you could explain that to me. Sure, I'll, I'll try. And then if Treasury staff want to jump in, um, they're welcome to, of course. Um, so first off, um, like the, the issue of the terminals is a little bit unusual because we have set up that liability. Um, and so it shows on the statement of financial position. But the judicial inquiry, that money is spent and gone. So it's not a liability. We haven't uh, tried to estimate further costs that are coming for the judicial inquiry. What's included in these statements is just what has been spent. I mean, there could have been a small amount that was owing at the end of the year that would be included in accounts payable, but it's not it's not the same accounting issue that we have for the terminals, because in that case, we've basically set up an estimate of what we think that that liability is for that contaminated site. Um, in terms of presentation of the expense, um, Perhaps Treasury needs to speak to that, but certainly from an audit point of view, I was quite happy uh, not having it shown as a separate line because they did include the disclosure of the expense separately in note eight. And so it's clear to a reader how much was spent um, on that line. And um, I don't know whether Treasury has any further comment on that, but. Marjorie, would you like to add to that? Uh, certainly, Your Worship. It was my feeling that um, after the the uh, point in time that council had approved uh, the fact that we should go ahead with the judicial inquiry, it became a normal operating expense, which is why I wouldn't consider separating it from the other expenses because once committed, we have to pay no matter what. Whereas with the uh, amount that we've set aside for the, uh, the terminals, it, it will perhaps take years to, uh, to be paid. So similar to what Sue said, We've already spent the money on the judicial inquiry and we're just setting aside part of the uh, surplus amount to uh, cover any potential uh, recoveries or, or rehabilitation that may have to happen on uh, the terminals. Any follow up, Councillor Doherty? No, thank you very much. Council, any questions or comments on the 
uh, audit inquiry report. All right, seeing none, uh, I have one or, or a couple, I think. Um, uh, Sue, uh, you've been doing our audit now for a number of years, and it seems to me about halfway through our last term, uh, you made a happy announcement at some point that we were in a net financial positive position as opposed to a deficit position. And it looks to me this year that we're about a little over 34 million into the positive. Am I reading that right? Uh, yes, um, you definitely have positive net financial assets and not all of our clients enjoy that position, let's say. <laughs> um, I would have to go back in prior financial statements to see when exactly that number became uh, a, a positive number and I'd be happy to provide that to you uh, later this evening if that's helpful. Oh, well, that would be great. Uh, I guess really I'm just looking at the trending and we're going in the right direction, it seems to me. Oh, and for sure. And as I look at a number of the comparators that you put in, and thank you for doing that, it shows that uh, we're in a fairly strong financial position uh, compared to the provincial average and, and, uh, and the recommended levels. Yes, in many, in many instances, for sure, you're tracking better than the averages. Great. Those are my questions. And uh, unless there's any other comments or questions, I will read in the resolution. It's moved by Councillor McLeod and seconded by Councillor Comey that the Auditor's Report 2019 financial statements be received. And uh, I will call the vote then. All in favor? And that is passed unanimously. Thank you very much, Sue, for all your hard work and to you and your team. And uh, we will look forward to passing these at our September 21st meeting. Great, thank you. Great, have a good night. Next up on the agenda is uh, the delegation of powers and duties bylaw. And uh, I will ask Clerk Almas to present, please. Certainly, thank you, Your Worship. To members of the committee. So this really is a, a group effort on putting this um, bylaw and policy together that's before you tonight. So we'll get into the background. So our next slide. So under section 270 in the Act, it requires the municipalities to adopt and maintain a policy with respect to delegation of its powers and duties. Collingwood has not had such a policy in place. We have a few bylaws that provide for specific delegate authority, but not a blanket bylaw policy. Uh, staff have been doing a number um, of these items for various reasons, whether it's been included in their job descriptions or it's been minor in nature or past practice. So it's very important to ensure that appropriate council delegation has been uh, provided. So this policy provides the CAO department heads and in some instances their delegates uh, the ability to perform minor administrative or operational contractual obligations on behalf of council. This delegation permits council to focus on policy setting over day-to-day -day operations of the corporation and creates much greater administrative efficiencies. Next slide. So council's overarching authority. All delegation of council powers, duties or functions shall be affected by bylaw or council. Unless a power, duty, or function of council has been expressly delegated by bylaw or resolution, all the powers and duties and functions of council remain with council. However, council still maintains this authority should the CAO or department head feel that the matter is significant of or, or of council importance to be cited by council in a public forum. All delegated powers and duties can be revoked at any time. Next slide. So general provisions, delegations are limited to administrative power only and not legislative. So an example would be staff could not enact a bylaw, nor could staff pass a budget. Delegations are limited to their respective departmental functions and shall be granted only by the CAO or department head, or if there is a designate specified. Any expect, uh, expenditure of funds must be within the council approved budget for that matter. And any delegate authority that delegates uh, uh, that the delegate or CAO deems to be significant in nature shall require a memo to council outlining the nature of the matter and any associated expenditures for inclusion on a consent agenda of the next appropriate standing committee or committee uh, meeting agenda. So this is to ensure accountability and transparency for council and the public. Next slide. 
designates, where council designates, uh, delegates a power or duty to a delegate, the delegate may appoint a designate to fulfill the responsibilities of that delegated power or duty only where expressly permitted. Designates would, uh, would be able to execute routine administrative functions that would not warrant the outright approval of a de department head. And examples that we provide are temporary road closures, issuance of business licensings, or this could be a matter in which uh, it, they are in the absence of the, the CAO or director, that power can be delegated. And the following is the proposed delegated authority list of items. Uh, so these have been identified uh, within the report and in the draft bylaw. So they include um, all of these provisions, including inclement weather. Uh, yeah, so we can go through all of them, um, or if anybody has any specific questions about specific ones, all department heads are available to uh, address any specific questions that you might have. All right. So that's our very brief summary and we're all available to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I will look to the gallery if there is anyone in our audience that would like to comment or has questions about the report on the delegated authority. And now is your opportunity. Okay. We do have a number of attendees and it does not look like an individual wishes to speak at this time. Just a reminder, you can enter a question in the chat or you, um, you are welcome to speak to the delegated authority uh, bylaw by indicating in the chat. There seems to be some activity in the chat box there, Sarah. So it looks like Matthew Pretty would like to talk. Okay. All right, so Matthew should be able to speak. Matt's joining us by phone. Are you, uh, uh, Matt, go ahead. It looks like you've been unmuted. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, okay. I just had to do star six. I'll just turn this down here. Um, with regards to road closures, um, do we have the proper signage, such as in the winter time, such as uh, Harbour Road or 26, if we had a flood over near Niagara? Uh, do we have the proper signage for climate change issues, such as uh, you know flood, uh, floods, uh, high wind, high water? Uh, do we need to invest in, in new signage due to uh, extreme weather events such as uh, floods or high winds? That's my question. Okay, thanks, Matt. We're uh, talking about the delegated authority, but if we have uh, Peggy on from Public Works, perhaps Peggy could answer that question. Good evening. Yes, we do. Yes, Public Works has um, a supply of uh, road closure signs and barriers and things that we need for um, all ki kinds of different emergency closures. Okay. And uh, certainly we do have a budget if, if we need more than uh, we do have an operating budget where we can purchase those under. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I just wanted to add that and I'll, uh, I'll stand by. Okay. Thank you. Are there, is there anyone else, Sarah, that's from the gallery? does not look like there's anybody else wishing to speak to this matter at this time. Okay, thank you. Well, then I'll open the floor to Council. Councilor, any questions or comments? Councilor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, through to the clerk, I think you were answering my question as I was writing it down, but I just wanted to clarify. My question was how soon after a delegated authority uh, was used was it reported? I think you said the next Council meeting. Is that what I heard? Is that correct? Yeah, so that's great. And this uh, is more of a formalization of our current practice as opposed to really s a lot of new uh, items being taken on. Would that be a, a correct summarization? A majority of these functions are very administrative through your worship to Councillor Jeffrey. Um, so this is really a, a, a very important tidy up document for us. There is a couple new items that are identified in here, but that is correct, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLeod. 
Thank you. Uh, through your, your uh, worship uh, to the CAO uh, on this topic, we are currently under delegated authority and have been since March the 16th. Director Skinner, or CAO Skinner. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor McLeod. Um, that is a good point. We do have uh, delegated authority for um, uh, COVID related decisions to the CIO for the existing services. Uh, so we can bring existing services uh, you know, back online or adjust them um, as needed uh, for COVID purposes. That's a great point. And as a follow up, uh, is there, um, are we expecting a report on that fairly soon? Uh, on on actions that have been taken, or are we sort of getting it every time we meet? I think I think we kind of get a little bit every time we meet, do we not? Sonia, through you, worship to Councillor McLeod. Uh, we do try to keep you informed each time that we have used them, but I would defer to the clerk. I believe that we were um, there was a requirement to provide a, a summary of the use of the uh, of that the delegated power um, over time. Could you please clarify if we need to do a full summary? Certainly through uh, your worship to uh, CAO and, and council. Uh, I believe that it was at the, the end of, um, actually, I, I, I would prefer to, to look at what it actually says and, and I'll advise council, but um, it was either um, uh, through the regular updates provided by the CAO or a, a summary at the end of the COVID event. So um, I will look and confirm. Okay. One last follow up uh, through you, Your Worship. When do we expect uh, uh, the COVID event uh, and the and thus the delegated authority to be over? I know the province has said so, but the uh, county has not. At uh, what point does delegated authority end? CAO. Uh, that's that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Through the. Uh, <laughs> through your worship to Councillor McLeod. Um, we have not anticipated the, the ending of the authority. I think that we would, uh, once we got these services, we, we fully got back to full services. There'd be very little intention uh, or requirement, in fact, to use the authority unless we had a resurgence of COVID and, for example, needed to shut down an arena quickly or, or the pool, for example, between uh, committee or council meetings. Um, so I, I hadn't anticipated a date, but I think it would potentially be related to the uh, um, finalizing of the emergency by the county and the province. Thank you very much. Council, any other questions or comments? Councilor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the matters that's on here is the ability for, through delegated authority, to sign minutes to settlement uh, for matters that are before LPAT. And uh, I wanted to ask through you, Mr. Mayor, our uh, acting CAO, whether uh, she would be content if there were words added that would clarify that the ability to execute minutes to settlement would be following council direction. Uh, yes, I think there was an email that went out and uh, go ahead, Sonia. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Hamlin. Um, uh, we would have no concerns with that and did, uh, in fact, uh, from a staff perspective, would always want to make sure that we were following the, uh, the general um, uh, litigation strategy that would have been set out with Council and uh, clarifying that in the delegation in the bylaw would be uh, of no concern and perhaps add good clarity uh, to staff. Thank you. And uh, just as a follow up, Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering how, I'll say technically, we can have that change made in for when this comes forward to council. Well, and there's just one of two ways uh, you could, there was an email that went out with some suggested wording. And if you'd like to put an amendment on the floor to incorporate that wording, uh, then we would vote on the amendment if you get a seconder and uh, then it would be included going forward. Or you could refer the matter back to staff and ask that they come forward with wording at the, uh, at the council meeting on September 21st. Well, I think I'd like to do the uh, second uh, option, Mr. Mayor, and have staff come back with the wording they're happy with. Okay. 
So then uh, what we will do is move forward with the motion today uh, in the, uh, with the format that it's in on the understanding that staff will come back uh, at the council meeting with uh, suggested wording to include uh, the, uh, the um, amendment that you're suggesting. And uh, I'm just going to look to the clerk to confirm that that's going to work uh, so that we deal with this up front to make sure we're, we're going to be give ourselves the room to do this. Sarah? Through, through your worship to council, um, I think that would be an appropriate um, way to move forward. We will include it in the amendment section of the staff report when it comes forward on the 21st. I know staff specifically have looked at that item as CAO Skinner had indicated today and are supportive of that change. So we'll make sure it's identified in that report. Okay. Thank you. Council, any other questions or comments? Before I call the vote, well, just a comment uh, to uh, commend staff, Sarah, uh, for this work uh, as the, with the public notice policy, this is something to clean up uh, and, and uh, get our policies in order to comply with the legislation. And uh, it's a thorough job. So thank you for that. Perfect. Thank you. So the motion is moved by Councillor Comey and seconded by Councillor Madigan. The Council receives staff report CAO 2020-7 and approve the delegation of powers and duties bylaw as attached here too, uh, with the uh, potential amendment as discussed. Uh, and I will look for call the vote then. All in favor. And I'm just looking at Councillor Comey, are, are you, uh, are we, when calling the vote on the uh, the uh, uh, no, sorry, the delegation bylaw. Okay, good. So that is passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item four point three is uh, CSS. Can you not see me? Okay, sorry okay. guys, it's really wonky. Okay. Uh, CCS twenty twenty dash six path forward. The calling with terminals, and I will look to uh, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I will uh, look to Executive Director Culver uh, to uh, talk about this report that he's done quite a bit of work in, uh, in putting together. Thank you. Go ahead, Dean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of Council. Um, uh, I would say, uh, before I take any more credit, uh, uh, CEO Skinner put a tremendous amount of work into it beforehand and is... Uh, been right by my side through the development of this report. Um, and so, and it's, uh, I, I will say that, you know, prior to this, one of us first sort of started the conversation or the, Sonia and I first started the conversation, I saw this project is nothing but completely daunting. Um, it's a massive, uh, massive project to undertake, uh, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the steps forward. Um, somewhere along the way, it became really, really interesting. And I think at this point, I would actually throw the word exciting in there at some point because, because as we're sort of going through all the different steps and getting responses to uh, the white paper and speaking to members of the public and speaking to actually just sort of um, um, fairly, uh, fairly apropos um, interested bodies, I would say, um, it's actually become really interesting to sort of look at the possibilities and define some of the, the challenges that we see. We know, for example, that there's a spirit uh, that understands the terminals to have a, a heritage aspect, and we couldn't define that. We just knew that it meant something to some people, um, and it really didn't even matter sort of how many people. We just knew that there were people who were very passionately uh, invested in the spirit of the terminals. So to go from understanding that sort of nostalgic reaction all the way to sort of understanding that we really need to do a heritage assessment to really kind of quantify or, or define that, um, that aspect. That's actually a really exciting shift for us because when you're living in the Merck, it's really hard to kind of figure out how to give advice to council, but this really gave us something to work with. Um, other things such as how would a, a request for proposals work and, and knowing that, you know, attempts to sell the terminals have occurred in the past, there have been proposals in the past, and, but, but starting to get a sense of what a process might look like, who might be involved in that process, how, how, a, how a measurement might happen, that's actually really exciting because we, got, we actually talked to people who really had ideas with merit, and so it was really exciting to think that that might be an outcome. 
Um, along the way, obviously, we, we have this conscious parameter of cost. We, we know, for example, that the, the liability has risen to $8, $8 million. Um, we know that the uh, you know, redevelopment cost is significant for a municipality of our size. Um, and so, you know, we had to live within sort of the fiscal parameters that we understand, um, at least atmospherically around this project. Um, but along the way, we, we got, I have a sense of optimism that, that we've, well, I, I can say the sense of optimism, I have a sense of certainty that we are providing you with a solid recommendation uh, from which we can work forward. So to quickly go through that, um, as I mentioned, one of the recommendations is that we conduct a heritage assessment. Um, I spoke to a, a really um, intelligent gentleman, Sean Fraser, who uh, worked with the, uh, actually with MMAH now, but he's uh, he's a provincial policy advisor, and he talked about the value of it and how it goes, how it actually happens, what a, what a, a statement of significance means, and how it will allow us to develop characteristics or a, an understanding of characteristics for the terminal. That whether the ultimate fate of these buildings is to be uh, knocked down, we still have an understanding, and we know what we can do in replacement of the building or to, to preserve and look after that, um, those attributes. Um, if the building is to remain and we have a, a solid proposal, we can learn what attributes need to be protected and preserved through an RFP redevelopment. So um, we learned that that was a really good idea. So that's one of our recommendations. Um, obviously, we're also recommending that we move to a request for proposals, um, looking for a public-private partnership. Um, uh, Sonia has a great deal of experience in P3s. I have much less. I've been learning as I go. I do think that we're in agreement that we need to provide uh, secure uh, some P3 expertise to help guide us uh, in this process um, so that we can understand what's in the best interest of the community as well as what is our best opportunity to develop a, a solid working partnership with a positive outcome. Um, the, we've estimated uh, through a number of uh, contacts that that uh, that could cost as much as $300,000 to run that process. And, um, and, and we identify it as an upset limit because there is some potential for it to go beyond that. We're pretty comfortable with the $300,000, but we want to work in partnership with council so that you have the understanding that we may come back and, and suggest a higher number depending upon um, how we go about developing this, uh, this process in, in, in conjunction with experts. Um, Obviously, we have a recommendation in there, and I think this is, it goes with us saying that any proposal, uh, the recommendations of a guidance group that we'd be forming um, would come back to council for final approval. And then the final recommendation um, is, is requesting a placeholder of three and a half million dollars. Um, and the reality is that there is almost no way that this is not going to cost the town of calling with some money. As we understand, there's an $8 million liability. There's a, a much bigger number for um, having the buildings remain under uh, you know, town ownership and, and under town management. Um, but, the, but there is has to be an investment. There, we, we're certain of this based on a number of things, not the least of which is the property just needs work. So the road itself, as, we're, as, uh, as everybody I believe is aware, is in dire need of, of upgrade. Um, it needs to be, we're, we're pumping it out twice a week now, uh, getting water out of the way as it deteriorates. Um, the, uh, the parking conditions there with, uh, you know, triple the, the, the normal volume to traffic out of the harbor this year. Uh, we need to fix parking. We need to formalize parking. There was a waterfront master plan. So these are all investments that effectively um, relate to the terminal buildings. And so um, as we go through the process of determining what's going to happen with the terminal buildings, this, is, this would be, for lack of a better word, our skin in the game. We'd be looking at some sort of investment in partnership with uh, a proponent um, and an understanding and want council to, to understand that there is an investment. It may, it may result in something that we have to do regardless of whether the terminal stand up and down, but it is, uh, it is something that we're going to need to do. So um, those are the recommendations. Um, I think the report it goes into some detail about sort of uh, what a heritage assessment does. Um, you know, it reflects on the, the public policy objectives that were identified through the white paper. Um, and uh, I guess at this point, I would just uh, suggest if you have any questions, uh, Sonia or I can, can try and help. Thanks, Dean. Um, before we get to council, I will uh, look to Claire Thomas to see if we have anyone from our audience that would like to comment on the staff report on the terminals. 
number of people present. Um, if anybody wishes to speak, please advise us in the chat. We do have an individual, James McCrimmon, that would like to speak, so we will unmute him. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is, uh, have you thought of having qualified um, silo or terminal engineers um, who are experts in the grain silos to actually evaluate the property? Uh, in the sense that Tacoma and previous people were engineers for buildings, but not necessarily the silo, which is a different sort of animal. Has that never been thought? I look to uh, either the CAO or executive director to answer that. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, no, we haven't really specifically sought out um, engineers that specialize in green silos. Um, it's an interesting thought, and I'll be honest, it's not it's not been presented to us, and we haven't really gone down that path. We have, uh, as the as the the caller mentioned, um, you know, engaged services engineering to get a structural assessment, and more importantly, I guess more pointedly. A hazardous uh, a hazardous condition assessment of the terminal building because it, that was sort of the point of the original engineering study. I guess um, I guess I'd have to sort of understand and, and maybe uh, maybe the uh, the caller can um, detail a little bit the, the reason why uh, because if if we're not in the grain business and I think they've been disabled as a grain uh, facility. Um, however, I, I if I, again. I'd, just sort of looking for uh, more information from the caller as to why why that might be a good idea. Absolutely. I mean, there are um, companies, uh, one in particular in the United States, uh, Burton, and they uh, specialize on grain silos that are now defunct as ours are. Um, but then they do go in and they, they look at it in a more, I guess, focused, um, more focused program so that when they're actually assessing how much um, the scaling is on the building or um, how much deterioration or how much mold has been actually penetrated within the concrete, they're a bit more um, capable of assessing what the actual fallout is. Um, what I might suggest is that uh, uh, either executive director or CAO, uh, uh, James, if you can leave your contact information with uh, or post it and leave it with our clerk that uh, you can connect offline and have that discussion. I see Sonia has part of her card up, so I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, CAO Skinner to comment as well. Go ahead, Sonia. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I had talked, to with, talked with Dr. McCrimmon uh, a while ago about some of his interests and ideas, so we have uh, exchanged contact information and uh, I would just summarize briefly that uh, I think if we had a specific purpose for the silos, we might invest in some more, um, or for that matter, ask a proponent to invest in, in a more detailed review for a certain purpose. Um, and I appreciate the input he's already provided. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, is there any follow-up to that, uh, Mr. McCrimmon? Well, one, one last question. If, if there were a proposal made before January, or sorry, uh, September 2021, um, is there a possibility that the council would be able to um, review the proposal? Well, I, I, uh, I wouldn't make a commitment off the top. We have uh, procurement obligations, and uh, my understanding is that uh, it, would, it would have to go through those proper channels. Uh, that's not to dissuade you from submitting anything, but uh, I think any decisions that uh, council makes with staff input would have to be done through an open and transparent process. But uh, again, I would invite you to, uh, to contact st staff uh, offline uh, and, uh, and follow up on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, do we have anyone else? Ooh, your worship, uh, Matthew Pretty would like to address the committee. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Yes, hi, it's 6.04 p.m. I was just wondering, could I have a minute to propose something? Well, you can phrase it in a, uh, as a question, Matthew. And yeah, that's it on the table. And we've, we've got a, a full schedule, so uh, you sure. can go ahead. Okay, so my vision for the elevator would be something of a tourism 
spectacle. Uh, is it is it possible to make the top floor into a tourism museum? The one idea I had was a museum. Director Culver uh, and, and Sonia, uh, the CAO, Sonia, uh, how about considering a museum approach with a private-public partnership that might be condominiums for the uh, ship, sailboat, uh, waterfront master plan? What about using more of a museum approach regarding the history of the shipyards like look look at Duluth Minnesota everyone's got to look at Duluth Minnesota's live camera and their harbor it's just beyond anyone's imagination like that is a working harbor what about a museum tourism opportunity with the elevator an actual elevator that takes people up to the top platform where people can look out and see the bay and all this kind of thing and and make it a working uh, employed space that the town owns and runs with a private-public partnership, as is on that PDF. Uh, over to you. That is my question and Thank proposal. You. Thank you for that, Matthew. Uh, I think, as we're hearing from Director Culver and CAO Skinner, this is an open process, and we're we're looking to going out to look at all options and explore all options. And uh, if we are able to find a private partner that would do that, then that would something we consider. Go ahead. Uh, Executive Director Skinner. Or yeah, I think, I th thank you, Your Worship. I think I think something that needs to be sort of set up front is that there is no shortage of ideas. Um, we've we've uh, discussed with many, many proponents, many, many potential proponents, um, a, a wide range, an unfathomable range of, of concepts for the terminals. Um, you know, Mr. Purdy is suggesting another one, and that's a fantastic idea. But one of the things we're constrained by is, is the town's ability to spend the minimum base amount of $10 million to keep, to restore the terminals to their, um, to a simply serviceable, serviceable state, and then oh. further develop beyond that. So that's a, that's a very difficult thing, which is why uh, staff are proposing an RFP process that would, uh, where a proponent would carry the load of that financial burden. So, Director Culver, stage one is maintenance. The $10 million investment, as Councillor Madigan would know, step one would be just maintenance, and then we would go more fancy. Right now, it's just hold back, get it done, and what's that going to cost? What, what would you average that cost to be to keep it, to maintain it, to bring it up to standard so it's not a liability? What's that going to cost the town? Well, I think, Matt, what the staff is reporting today is that we go out for tenders proposals to look for partners to push this thing forward we're setting aside a, a contingency of 3.5 million to oh, assess yeah. and uh, and so i think we're starting the process now sure sure so i don't the waterfront know. master plan very good very good i will that. sign off here the waterfront master plan has to be followed and we need to maintain the harbor we got to bring it up to standard we need more bathrooms down there but good job on heritage road Mission accomplished. It was re-leveled, and there's thousands of people down there this summer. And honestly, engineering and PRC stepped up, got it done, got it leveled, and the washrooms are deployed. Good job, Town Council. You did an excellent job this summer. It was a hell of a summer. So thank you. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. And we still have three weeks of summer left, officially. Don't wish it away. All right. Is there anyone else, uh, Sarah, who would... Uh, like to address from that gallery. Again, if you wish to speak, please either type it into the chat or question or choose the raise your hand feature. And it doesn't appear that there's any further comments on this item. Okay, Council, I'll open the questions uh, to Council. Go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. And I've got Councillor Berman and Councillor Dord. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I thought this was a uh, uh, a really fantastic report. Um, I think it really put everything to, together for us and I know how much work it was to make it easy for us to read. And I really didn't have one question until till now. And that's um, when we refer to skin in the game at three and a half million. Is it 11 and a half million if you include the 8 million liability we have in our current financial statements? I just wanna have a realistic view of what our skin in the game is. Executive Director. Uh, through, you, through your worship, yeah, that's that's a good way to kind of look at it. If if we were in a position of 
for example, in the in the final scenario of tearing the building down, that road still needs to be dealt with. Um, it might not be quite three and a half million dollars because that's an assessment including um, a large scale servicing requirement. The servicing requirement might be smaller, um, but at this at the end of the day, your what your understanding is true. Any follow up, Councilor Jeffrey? No, that was great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Berman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sanderson. Uh, I just sort of like Councillor Jeffrey wanted to say I'll be uh, supporting this uh, as is. Uh, it far exceeded my expectations as a report, uh, and I love the title, Path Forward. So uh, that's all I wanted to say about it. My name is Heritage Path Forward. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, through you to Executive Director Culver. Um, Thank you. This is an excellent report, as has already been indicated. Um, the depth and breadth, and um, you know, the beginnings of a way forward, are are make me feel very cautiously optimistic about this uh, very important part of our heritage and one of our assets. Um, the Tacoma study did point to some urgencies and talking about the original report that came out a year or so ago uh, some urgencies relative to the two towers um, because there is broken glass um, because the uh, glass frames are rusted uh, the uh, weather elements are getting in um, birds are getting in and i'm wondering um, speaking of skin in the game whether there is some way in which the town um, should and could prevent further deterioration by addressing those most urgent uh, needs uh, for uh, maintenance of the tower and prevention of further, uh, further damage. Executive Director. Uh, so through you, Your Worship, um, a number of the challenges, I, I should say the very, very urgent challenges in the Tacoma report were addressed. Um, the things like um, the sealing off of the Marine Tower, the Marine Tower is probably the most compromised part of the building and it's because the birds have taken up habitat in there and um, it's, a, it's a toxic environment. Uh, so that's now sealed off from the major part of the building. And, uh, but the, the, uh, the, sorry, the bin floor uh, is actually in good shape. Um, and the other components of the building are relatively good shape. Certainly, you know, <laughs> the, the Tacoma report th suggests that there should be an investment. And the Tacoma report also suggests that over time, that investment's gonna get more expensive if we were just to sort of let it go and not invest. I think what SACAP is suggesting right now is that we move forward, you know, with some expediency on, on looking for a partner so that investment that we make is in, is in alignment with what, a proponent uh, would need in order to enable the building for use. And I think that's sort of, it, it's, a, it's a very tough gamble, I'll be honest, because we don't know for sure, for sure that we'll get a proponent. We don't know the proposal will be um, acceptable. Um, and we have to work on a lot of details in order to get to a place where we are actually literally implementing and moving forward. But to, for staff to suggest a major investment in the building at this point before receiving proposals is, uh, potentially spending money where money would not be properly placed. So we're we're kind of <laughs> we're kind of in a bit of a quandary trying to figure out what the right step is. And this is the step that we've suggested that we go and find a, a P3 partner and uh, and and hold in reserve a three and a half million dollar um, amount uh, to be used as an investment towards the ultimate survival of that building uh, should it be repurposed. Yes, uh, so um, if I can just um, uh, restate your answer. So uh, within the three and a half million that you're proposing, uh, some of that funding could go to uh, prevention of further deterioration of uh, the, two, the two towers. Dean? Is it so yeah, so through your worship, that would be part of the negotiation with a successful proponent from the P3. So they may say, for example, we just want you to get services brought in. We'll take care of looking after the building and getting it brought back to 
to uh, an appropriate uh, standard so that we can now redevelop it into whatever the future project will be. Um, or they might say, you know what, we really need you to do the rehabilitation of the of these components of the building and they'd use um, the town stake money and they'll take care of servicing the building. It, it could be a number of outcomes. So I, I'm agreeing with you. I just want to make sure we're clear on sort of, yes, it, it is a, it is, there is still a TBD amount of a component of this project because we don't have a proponent. We haven't seen proposals. Um, it, I, I guess I, I thought that your question really had to do with, would we invest in it today? And that's a tough question to answer because investing in it today may not be the right investment given what we're going to find out through this RFP process. So that's, that's sort of, hopefully that helps. I see. I, see. I saw you had your card up there. Would you like to add to that? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you also to Councillor Doherty. Um, after the report from Tacoma, a Council had approved some immediate uh, items for maintenance. So there was a closing off of a number of windows. There was tie-offs on the roof so staff could be uh, safe while they were doing some of the work. Um, I think there might have been a securing of some staircases. Yes. Uh, a number of things like that. And as of uh, this year's budget, there was still, I can't remember exactly how much was in there, there a couple different figures in my mind, but the largest one was 135,000. But I think that was all of that maintenance work, not necessarily the, uh, the 2025 portion of it, sorry, 2020 portion of it. And um, I would also want to look into just if any of that was slowed by COVID, because we may have some um, smaller amounts uh, for immediate maintenance that should be part of the, uh, typically would have been part of the operating budget proposed for 2021. If so, they would be minor amounts, but there is a short list of items that were proposed in the Tacoma study um, yes. just to arrest immediate needs. And I think those are the ones that you might be talking about and we haven't forgotten those. Thank you. Any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? Uh, uh, not at this time, thank you. Okay, Councillor McLeod. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Executive Director Culver, I too want to uh, pass on my uh, thanks, uh, and uh, not just for the report that you have created, but also for your enthusiasm uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you appear to have developed through the course of this project. And and uh, you have spoken in previous times uh, recently regarding uh, projects that have been handed to you that you uh, started with a sense of trepidation and ended up embracing. And so uh, I, for one, am glad to see that uh, that we are contributing to your personal growth. Uh, so <laughs> my question, however, is sort of a follow-up on, um, on what Councillor Doherty had to say. And, and I'm looking at the uh, timeline uh, that is provided with the report here. And so it would appear to me as though absolutely no work will take place at the site uh, until uh, after at least the spring of 2022, uh, because Prior to that, it's going to be thinking and discussing and negotiating and more thinking, negotiating and and communing with the um, the guidance group that's going to be created. And so, uh, am I correct in that in that that pretty much no work can happen until spring of twenty twenty two? Yeah. Uh, through your worship, I, I think um, as CEO Skinner has mentioned, there's some you know minor sort of uh, operational expenses we take to sort of look after things, keep things maintained and, and you know, lubricated for whatever that means. Um, but the, uh, yeah, no major capital works at all until 2022. Um, you'll notice in, you know, there was a, a discussion about um, putting forth the idea of securing legacy funds to advance the, the, the road part of it. And I think there's two parts to this that, um, department heads and and uh, kind of came back with which is is one is there's there's a previous uh, discussion about postponing uh, decisions on the legacy fund and so we wanted to honor that recent decision and not sort of put a challenging quandary in front of council uh, second thing was that until we get into conversations with a public private partner um, it, it's probably prudent for us to hold back until such time as we know uh, what the essential need will be in that partnership. Uh, so yeah, so there is there is no planned capital works. Could we do something before that? Well, again, that would be dependent upon council's will and, and where the funding comes from. Um, 
but for right now, that's the plan. Right. Uh, Councilor CAO Skinner, you had your card up there. Yes, sir, and thank you, uh, through your worship. Um, an assumption that has been made in laying out this timeline um, is that there would be a short listing of proponents so that we wouldn't ask proponents to come in with their you know, securities and 200 page proposals in the first instance, what we would do is look for a set of proposals, um, uh, indicators of in interest to make sure that before people went into that level of effort, council was comfortable that the proposals that we were bringing forward and wish to entertain were in line with the public policy objectives that council would like to see, things like retaining uh, public access to the waterfront, for example. So that does add some time um, to the turnarounds. And I think if anything, this timeline is, is doable, if slightly, even slightly generous, but I wouldn't want to be back with council again saying, whoops, we meant a year later than that. Um, it's, quite, it's quite realistic with that additional, I think, needed step in the process. Uh, Dean, you had your hand up. Yeah, sorry, just to, just to add in, uh, because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you council have the best staff in the world. Dave McNulty has just messaged me to uh, reinforce that we are getting back to securing uh, windows this fall. So we have budget and we're planning to get that work done this fall. Um, and that's likely the biggest liability from the original Tacoma report. So that is being addressed. Um, it's budgeted for something less than $100,000. Um, and we're still looking after health and safety concerns as a matter of course. So that's that's over and above any RFP outcome. That's something that uh, you've done. But I wanted to pass that on because Dave is paying attention and helping me out in real time here. Thank you, Dean. Any follow up, Councillor McLeod? Uh, uh, only to say that I, my comments, my question was not intended as a criticism in any way. I was just trying to be clarifying and uh, and to be and to understand exactly what it is that we're doing here and. And, uh, and so that I can maybe curb my own enthusiasm a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it was taken that way. So thanks for the clarification. Any other comments, Council? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, uh, firstly, a comment. I just love the uh, outline here of how we're going to proceed step by step. Um, and that we're going to retain a consultant uh, experienced in private public partnership matters. Um, and then I, I, my question is, uh, I see by the spring we'll be developing a governance group. And my question is whether, uh, or if there's any thoughts around uh, how that group would be selected or what the qualifications would be at this time. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. That's an excellent question and, and something I've put a lot of thought to. I won't say enough yet, but I think um, where we're starting is that uh, through different means, we're identifying um, uh, a series of expertise that we need uh, just off the cuff, uh, arranging from engineering to architecture to heritage architecture, um, uh, planning. There's a, there's a bunch of expertise that we're going to need to tap into. Um, there's also another piece of this, which is a, a public consultation piece. So, so while we see ourselves acquiring a body of experts for the governance group, there's also a need to do an open call to the community, uh, which will involve council uh, in a selection process to identify members of the community who can contribute to this as well. Um, obviously, what, one of the things that's come out of this, uh, you know, everything we've discussed so far is that our grain silos, as much as is there are examples across the world of repurposed grain silos. Ours are actually quite unique. And um, if you look even in, in Buffalo, which has the largest number of grain silos in the world, they don't have any that are like ours. And that's not to say they, they don't have, you know, concrete construction and they're not, you know, vertical in nature or whatever. But as ours sort of sits out at the end of a, of a spit, effectively they're on water and um, and not not surrounded by any infrastructure otherwise. And, and these are all kind of unique characteristics. There's also sort of, as we go through the, the heritage assessment, you know, landmark attributes. Um, there's certain architectural, uh, there's unique architectural qualities uh, based on how they were built, how they were built in record time, the period of time in which they were built. So um, there's a lot of, uh, 
there's a lot of community investment in this. Um, and so we need to have some reflection from the community, some involvement in the community in terms of understanding how we proceed and what steps would be recommended to council or what project would be recommended to council. So that'll be an open call. Um, and then further than that, we also see council having a, a role in this as well uh, through a representative member. Uh, so we'd have to sort of establish that piece as well. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is just to understand uh, the spending of the funds and uh, again, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Acting uh, Executive Director Culver. Um, am I right in thinking that we're being asked in this report to commit $340,000 for, and, and it may go higher, and I understand there'll be consultation as we go through, but for the process that will get us to the point of selecting um, a partner to do this project or saying, no, this isn't feasible. Is, is that what that, those funds are to get us through that time frame? In, through your worship, in a nutshell, that's right. Okay, and then just as a supplementary to that, the, the three and a half million that we've been talking about, that would be a commitment that we would make after that point, um, the process is finished and either we're gonna get into an agreement with a private partner or we're gonna say, no, that was a bad idea, we're gonna demolish. And, but that's the point, the three and a half million would be, we'd be looking at spending that, is that, is that correct? <laughs> Dean? Yes, yes, with some clarification. So the three and a half million dollars, just, just to be perfectly clear, and I think you already know this, the three and a half million dollars does not constitute the demolition amount. Yeah. It only constitutes additional investment in the spit in order to make it something. Uh, the demolition amount is the liability that was discussed earlier. Just, just for clarification, I, I assumed you knew that. Okay, thank you. And my last point is really just a comment. I noticed that um, at the end, it's a, at the end of the. I don't know what you call it, a chart setting out the steps to be taken. Um, it suggests an update on the waterfront master plan with the spit being considered as one entity. And likely by the time we get to that point, our new official plan should be well underway in terms of its final drafts and so on. And that waterfront master plan will get incorporated into our official plan. So really just a thought for staff to consider um, you know, maybe making that spit area a special study area if we get out of sync with uh, where the um, where we're going to be at in terms of this public private process. And that was all. So thank you. Thank you. Council, any other questions or comments before I call the vote? It's a lengthy vote, but before I do uh, put it on the table, I want to I just add my uh, congratulations to staff. This is uh, a very thorough report, but it also is a very comprehensive one in terms of outlining the various steps, the costs associated with each step and the timeline. Uh, it does give me a little bit of deja vu. I think uh, the deputy mayor will recall that back in 2012, the Central Park Steering Committee did ask council to invest in a market sounding to look at potential opportunities for the terminal. So we've got here and I think we're in, in a good place and the timing is right. So with that said, uh, the motion is moved by Councillor Madigan and it's seconded by uh, Councillor Doherty. The council seek a private sector investor to redevelop the terminals and or the terminal site while upholding council's public policy objectives, which include public access to the waterfront, significant public green space and an approach that respects and celebrates the historic significance of the terminals and the shipyards. The council directs staff to engage a consultant to conduct a heritage assessment of the Collingwood Grain Terminals funded up to $40,000 from the 2020 operational budget. The council authorized staff to proceed with a request for proposals for redeveloping the Collingwood Terminals buildings within the parameters and public policy objectives outlined in this report. This process to include one act acquiring through transparent procurement processes, the service of consultant experts in public private partnerships, two promotion of the RFP opportunity to as large a marketplace as feasibly possible, three acquiring through transparent procurement processes and an open application process, expert services and community participation on a guidance group to evaluate proposals, that the above authorization be subject to appropriate funding being approved through the 2021 budget process and or the asset sale proceeds decision in early 2021 with an upset limit estimated to be approximately $300,000.
the council directs staff to return the proposal evaluation recommendations of the guidance group to council for final approval and the council authorize a placeholder of $3.5 million within the proceeds of the hydro utility and airport asset sales to enable council to act on terminal or spit related opportunities, such as the potential upgrade of heritage drive, including utilities and or the creation of related park facilities with work to proceed after the RFP award non-award decision. And with that being said, I will call the vote all in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. So that brings us to uh, departmental updates and other business. Uh, 5.1 COVID-19 financial update. And uh, Marjorie, I think you're taking us through that, please. Thank you, Worship. This is just going to be a, a, a quick um, uh, there's four slides, I believe it is, and it's just to uh, provide updates on the costs and commitments that have been made from our the emergency COVID fund to date, and also just to provide an overview of where we stand in relation to taxes receivable at the end of August. Next slide, please. Next slide after that. So, so far, the um, emergency COVID fund we have either committed or spent um, $579,071 to date. Um, the largest of those amounts being the pledge to assist um, the hospital with the uh, generator at um, the Legion um, and um, the economic recovery task force plan of 75,000. Um, up to $40,000 for the expansion of uh, patio on the uh, main street. Um, and uh, total just, uh, I'm not gonna call them minor expenses, but items uh, like um, the town of Collingwood masks, uh, cloth masks that we bought, the PPE, the plexiglass, the additional um, uh, sanitization wipes and uh, all of those types of things that, that have been spent throughout all of the departments. And uh, that would also include the uh, additional cleaning costs for um, the uh, bus and uh, a few of the other facilities that we have cleaning contracts out for. We spent about $185,000 there. And uh, the penalty and interest waiver, which ended at uh, the end of April, has uh, roughly cost us $132,500. Next slide. When I go to take a look at the uh, taxes uh, receivable, because what we did um, was waive the um, interest on the current year, the 2020 taxes outstanding only. And uh, this is a breakdown so you can see exactly how much was waived and in which month they were waived. When you take a look at um, the May, uh, the uh, second installment was due in the month of May. And we had a large $45,000 uh, write off there indicating that a lot of the people didn't, uh, uh, they're held off on the uh, May payment to see where uh, they were going to end up in, in uh, uh, which financial situation they were going to end up in. But when it comes down in the uh, months of June and July, some of those people that had been outstanding in May had actually continued to make payments or had been able to make a payment in one of those other two months. Next slide. At the end of August 2020, our total outstanding arrears, this is interest and uh, uh, taxes for the last uh, three plus years, including the current, we had uh, 19 million 600,000. And when you take a look at the August 2019 amount, it was 18 million 757,000. So the outstanding arrears are $835,180 higher than the 2019 level. But if we go to the uh, next slide, it's what is more important is, is the actual current year arrears, just those people who had trouble making their 2020 um, 
tax uh, payments. So we look at that at the end of August, it was $17,100,000 in outstanding current year taxes compared to the 16767 for 2019. So our current year arrears were $332,000 higher than the 2019. But when I take a look at the payments that were received between September 1st and September 3rd of 2020, that was $343,000. Whereas in the uh, same period during 2019, we only received $10,800. So by the time we hit the 3rd of September, we were comparable to where we were um, in uh, 2019, which is a, it's, it's a good sign. And the other thing that we have to remember is that uh, the 2020 taxes that we invoiced were actually uh, $1.4 million higher than uh, those of 2020. So I think our, um, our statistics in terms of the uh, taxes and collections are uh, going in the right direction. And... Uh, Hopefully we shouldn't have a large um, current year um, uh, lack of collections by the end of the year. The current year is always the one that makes up the largest portion of the total arrears by the end of the year, I believe. Or um, if I was to look at 2019, I believe at the end of December, there was a total of 3,800,000, but the current year, the 2019 at that time was roughly 2.4 million. So we have made uh, uh, collections on a lot of those items, but the outstanding, uh, the people that owed money from previous years, three and, and four years back, we have been making some headway on collection of those as well during the COVID time. So um, things in terms of our tax arrears may not be as uh, doom and gloom as had first been um, anticipated by us or by a lot of the other uh, municipalities out there. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, and I'm just gonna confirm with the clerk, uh, as these are staff updates, my understanding is I go directly to uh, council for questions, um, but I just need you to confirm that, please. That's correct, your worship. All right then, Council. So are there any questions or comments? Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson, and, and through you to uh, Treasurer Marjorie. Uh, I just had an FCM meeting today specific to the budget impacts for municipalities. So I wanna just um, follow up on some things to ensure that they, they were included because when we get to the consent agenda, those kinds of things will be important. Um, did, did we include things like our uh, extraordinary bylaw costs to enforce the provincial orders at the waterfront and to uh, facilitate the resident only parking? Through you, Your Worship, no, not at this point in time. Those costs will be will be accumulated and, and I, I, I can't guarantee. I'm getting ready to, to, you know, walk off into the sunset here, but <laughs> we, right. we, will, we will attempt to have those accumulated for, um, uh, October. Okay. At some point in October. Thank you. And then through you again, Mayor Saunderson. So that would then also include things like um, uh, the transit fare uh, loss of revenue and the parking revenue losses. And then I was wondering in terms of projects, the delay of the ministry issuance of the uh, permit for the Sunset Point work did that result in a higher cost for us on that project? Because that would be ap applicable as well. Uh, through you, Worship, that might be a but, question that uh, um, either uh, Dean or uh, Mel. Uh, yeah. maybe and I, I don't need the answer now. I'm just saying those are the kinds of things that we definitely need to be adding to that COVID number. If there was. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLeod. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding uh, sort of as a follow up to what uh, Councillor Jeffrey has had to say. And, and I and I see in the consent agenda that we've received a couple of letters suggesting that we're going to get a fair chunk of change uh, from the federal and provincial governments to cover our expenses. But we um, put aside um, two and a half million dollars earlier this year, uh, taking it um, perhaps temporarily, perhaps not temporarily out of our 
asset sales. And, and so my question is, is the amount of money that the federal government and the provincial government has forwarded to us to cover our COVID expenses, uh, it would strike me that uh, 754000 plus 161328 is more than the 579000 that you've added up in this report, Marjorie. And so I'm wondering, is it looking as though that $2.5 million that we set aside might well be able to be put back? Through Sorry. your worship. Sorry, um, through your worship. Sorry about that. Yep. The, um, the uh, initial um, uh, resolution actually did um, indicate that... Uh, once the provincial state of emergency had ended, any remaining funds uh, from this emergency uh, contingency fund would be returned to the asset sale proceeds funds. So regardless of whether 579,000 is the end number, we have uh, reporting requirements in order to, to um, maintain uh, receipt of both sets of those funds. So we need to have it all documented. If we spend more than the 754 or the 161, we may have to use some of those uh, that uh, reserve fund. However, if there if if we don't max out the grants, then uh, there will not be a need to take money from the emergency fund. Thank you very much, Council. Any other questions or comments, Councilor Hamlin? Thank you for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to our treasurer. Am I right in thinking our arrears and property taxes, other than the current year, is somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 million? Marjorie? Uh, no, through, through you, Your Worship. If I'm taking a look at my total arrears being um, at the end of, um, let me just flip to the screen. If I'm looking at my total arrears, at the end of August 2020, being 19 million 500, and I'm looking at my August 31st arrears uh, just for 2020 of uh, 17 million 100. We're talking about uh, 2.4 still at that that point. Thank you for that clarification. That's all my questions. Thanks, Council. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. Uh, then. Um, through uh, to Marjorie or uh, CAO Skinner, uh, we have referenced the uh, funds that we've received from the uh, provincial government, and I'm wondering uh, how those get reconciled and what the reporting pro uh, process is. Through through you, Your Worship, they haven't released the actual templates or the forms yet, but in those letters that they have uh, provided us, they do indicate that that uh, of course. The same as most of the other granting processes, we'll have to retain our our um, invoices, and there's uh, you know it'll have to be specific to um, a COVID-related item. Like we, we're easy to prove things like additional uh, uh, sanitization in terms of um, the bus lines because Sinton has uh, actually provided that for us. But I'm assuming that um, in in most of the other grant type incidences we have you can do do all of the filing online but we would send in the invoices that we'd receive for uh purchasing the plexiglass or the masks or the shielding or that it's just a matter of accumulating the um, invoices and uh scanning them in really and and uh supplying that to uh to the province okay, or the thank you all right then moving on to the next item on the Agenda item 5.2, uh, leasing diversity grant for video cameras. And I think uh, CEO Skinner is taking that one. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm bringing this one up today uh, because there's a deadline for a grant that uh, is closing tomorrow. And this item was discussed at the Police Services Board uh, recently, and uh, the minutes have not yet, uh, yet come up. Uh, so, uh, inspect, uh, um, Inspector Shannon and uh, Staff Sergeant Meckler brought up that there was a grant, there is a grant available, and it is for um, uh, cameras. And uh, they indicated that the grant was up to $400,000. Uh, 
um, the uh, municipality would pay half of the amount and um, it's under the Guns, Gangs and Violence Task Force. So they did uh, state that there are a number of things happening in the community related particularly to, um, uh, to drugs that they were interested in uh, having cameras for. However, at the uh, Police Services Board, we were thinking somewhere in the range of uh, 30 plus thousand, potentially up to 50. And uh, subsequent to that, at the end of August, I received a call from Inspector Shannon and she had done some more work with several alarm service providers, and it looked like for one to two locations, um, the cost was growing to around $75,000 plus some consulting to get it set up, and an ongoing cost of between, um, uh, in the range of $15,000 per year. Uh, she and I both felt that um, uh, the costs were starting to outweigh the benefits and there were some other options that the, that type of funding could be, be spent on. Um, one of the ones that's in play and has not been decided by council, uh, but is looking at look, being looked at under the uh, traffic calming report is the, uh, the potential for um, photo radar. Uh, although that's certainly not the only thing we could spend town funds on as you'll hear in my next update about the upcoming budget. Uh, so, um, uh, Inspector Shannon and I uh, agreed that uh, we both were not looking to have uh, this item go forward, though of course Council still could put a motion on the table that you wish to commit this type of funds. Um, uh, if we did go forward, we would get half the funds uh, if we were awarded the grant, so half of the 75000 and we would be required to uh, host the uh, host the cameras and pay the ongoing operating costs ourselves each year. Uh, we did have a subsequent, uh, to finalize that uh, piece with Inspector Shannon and I, we talked about the value of the camera that's existing in the clock tower and the potential to enhance that camera or add, add other cameras there and um, thought that we could bring that um, offline as a staff discussion just to see if there was any, any options to pursue uh, that avenue going forward. Uh, and that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Are there any questions or comments on this item? Councillor McLeod, go ahead. Are we, and uh, thank you, through you, Your Worship, uh, to the CAO. So um, are we voting to spend a bunch of money on this or are you just letting us know that we're gonna ask for it? And if we get the grant, are we now committed to doing this? Go ahead, Sonia. Through you, Your Worship, to Councillor McLeod, um, what I'm recommending is that we do not apply for the grant. And um, I'm providing this recommendation to you today because when you do receive the minutes, um, you will see that the Police Services Board voted to bring this item forward to Council. Uh, however, when it gets to Council, it will be past the deadline to apply. Got it. Uh, so I want you to respectfully know that the Police Services Board endorsed this at a, at a lower value and we now understand it's a higher value and I'm providing the staff recommendation not to apply, in which case you would not need to take any action today. And that is the action I will take. Thank you. Good. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, I know you're chair of the Police Services Board. Do you want to make any comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor Sonson. Just to say that it, it did put us procedurally in a difficult spot knowing that the the opportunity to apply was going to come before we could get our request to council. So we did ask um, the CAO to um, look after uh, following up on it on our behalf and getting it to council the best way possible. And uh, I think between she and Inspector Shannon, they've come up with uh, the appropriate response and uh, we do uh, thank uh, the CAO for taking the time to do that. Thank you. Unless there's any other comments or questions on this item, item I propose we move on to 5.3, which is the initial 2021 budget discussions and expectations and uh, executive director, uh, sorry, CAO Skinner is gonna lead us on this discussion. Go ahead, Sonia. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, you were circulated from the clerk's office an adjusted agenda that includes the handout for uh, the update I'm going to provide you with now. 
Um, it, uh, it, there's about four, four pages of material that I will go through at a very high level. And I thought that the, uh, having it in writing might be useful for your reflection as you, uh, as you go forward. And I wanted to thank Treasurer Leonard and our upcoming Treasurer Switzer and the department heads for their input into uh, this material. And the purpose is to give SIC and ultimately Council an opportunity to consider the budget context, the approach and schedule that we're planning to take, uh, the scenarios that you would like staff to consider, and how we're going to look as staff at the priorities when we recommend them to you. So I know that when we finished the budget last year, there was uh, a, um, a, a several bits of feedback that I received that uh, um, we probably could do a better job making sure we understood council's intentions before we put together the document. So the proposed motion I'll preview briefly and then I'll explain it as I go through the couple of pages that follow. Uh, so we're looking that council endorse the budget planning schedule um, we're looking that you endorse the criteria that we would use to qualitatively assess and rank um, additional expenditures that might come forward. Um, we're looking to uh, develop a bud to have a budget scenario recommended and staff are recommending that we hold the tax rate the same as it was last year. So essentially our, our property owners will be paying the same amount they did last year and that the operating a portion of the budget be capped at 2% above the 2020 operating budget and any additional uh, revenue uh, be budgeted into a capital asset renewal or one of our de depleted reserves or reserve funds. So the broader context of the budget that's coming for 2021 um, and I want to give a disclaimer up front is that it's complex and we only have generalities at this point, but they're, um, uh, we want you to have those generalities. And as councillors would know, but some of our listeners may not, uh, the town collects its funding largely from property taxes. And there's a formula for that, which says that the property tax level levy or the total property tax is the value of your property um, as it is calculated by the arm's length municipal property assessment corporation times an applicable tax rate. And on top of those tax rates for uh, property tax, we also get funding from grants, uh, non-tax income like user fees at the pool, for example, development charges and a capital levy. And of note, um, we are not suggesting that uh, we uh, uh, changed that capital levy. It's been at 0.75%. And in the, under this proposal, we would come forward with the capital levy remaining at 0.75% for council's consideration. So just to, from a context perspective, in 2019, our total operating and capital budget was about 93 million. However, we don't get to use that all ourselves. The county levy, and the education levy are paid to those entities. And our own budget in the past two years has increased from uh, 32.4 to last to this year being uh, 33.9 uh, million. Now, due to COVID, there's an unusual situation with our, uh, our owner's property values. Um, oh, MPAC is not going to phase in increased property values and they will reuse last year's property values for 2021. So therefore we have a more confident understanding of what our property tax uh, could be. Uh, we just need to add in the new properties that came online, the in-year assessments in 2021. And uh, if you're around the town, you'll know that those are called supplemental taxes or SUPs. So if we raise the same dollar amount of tax we did last year, um, the town's tax rate would go down uh, by 3.28% from last year. And we get the same money that we had last year. Uh, but don't get too excited about that one because we still have a number of factors that um, um, would use up that, that funding quite quickly. However, if we maintain last year's tax rate at 0.705 and a few more decimals, then uh, the tax levy would be 35 million 
and 83,000, which is an increase of about 1.15 million or 3.39%. And that would mean that what you paid last year in your property tax would be the same amount you're paying this year in your property tax, but more new properties have come online and thus the town's coffers would be larger than they had been the year previously uh, this year. Uh, we do have some unknowns about uh, arrears as uh, Marjorie was uh, covering um, a couple of presentations ago in her update. Um, it's because we're about 84% dependent on residential taxes. So the actual cash flow could be somewhat variable. So without any changes, it says chances in the document, but it should say changes in service or staffing. It is expected that the town's cost will be increasing and our best guess is between one and 2%. Uh, indicators have varied uh, widely, probably given COVID. CPI seems to be going somewhere between zero and 1%, the consumer price index, CPI. However, the non-residential building price in index has already increased 2.6%. And we've certainly seen those increases in our own tenders um, this year. And the Bank of Canada uh, continues to aim for a 2% inflation target. So we're thinking inflation would be up to 2%. There are um, some uh, known major increases and decreases in our funding. And you cannot add, the, well, you can add these numbers up. It will not provide you with the full picture, but we wanted to just give you a flavor of some of the things that are changing. For example, the judicial inquiry expenses, uh, which we budgeted $800,000 this year, will not be required next year. There'll just be some small remaining um, uh, costs for document storage and that kind of thing. We have provincial modernization funding. There's over $500,000 remaining, and we can use it over multiple years, so that could be a benefit. We've received the provincial and federal COVID funding that was just discussed. Uh, pushing uh, toward a million dollars there. And uh, we're hoping that the federal government's announcement on uh, green economy funding may be something that the town could seek um, in, the, in this coming year. But on the other side, we have reductions in the available funds. For example, last year we used about $200,000 in interest from the asset sale proceeds. Uh, I don't expect council will want to use that again. And if you did, the rates I'm, uh, are unfortunately uh, below what they had been last year and that funding wouldn't be available. As well, we have had uh, significant depletion in our life cycle reserve fund. And uh, while the new asset management plan hasn't been published, uh, the core linear assets are due in June of 2021. Uh, the 2014 report has said that we're under investing about $2 million annually, and we haven't had any uh, indication that that's wrong. And you did hear from Sue Bragg, our auditor recently, that while, you know, from a, an audit rules perspective, um, they're looking at the original cost of the assets. In the asset management plan, we're looking at the actual go forward cost that council will be required to pay to keep those assets in their target condition. So uh, outside the financial side, uh, the other context for the budget that uh, is coming to you is that, of course, which probably goes without saying, but we have to continue to, to deliver the existing programs and services. Um, we're pleased that we've already made many accountability and transparency improvements. So we hope that uh, while we're going to listen to the judicial inquiry um, very, very carefully, the, uh, we hope that there won't be a lot of financial um, investment there. And we have our updated uh, community-based strategic plan and vision. We think it's COVID that's made Collingwood even more desirable for residents and visitors, um, but maybe it's just that we're desirable overall. Certainly our parks are seeing that and our, our, our sales of uh, residences and their costs are seeing that. But there are many unknowns and there's a few, a few listed there, including uh, judicial inquiry, what's happening with the Business Development Center and the Accelerator, and the compensation review for staff and council compensation. 
at the top of the mind for our 2021 strategic deliverables, you'll see that a lot is happening. Um, this has been a busy and ambitious council term. Um, the significant items uh, that you would like to see done should be here. And one would hope that there's nothing extra here that's not, that there are things that you won't want to see done. Um, by being in this list, it doesn't mean that these items are costing additional funds. Uh, many of them, even most, can be done within the existing, um, existing uh, envelopes. Um, at a high level, we've got uh, COVID expenditures. Uh, we think that it's a consideration, but it's not the story of 2021. At least we hope it's not the story of 2021. Uh, we have uh, service enhancements in our custodial contracts um, and our transit buses and a review of our master accommodation plan needs considering that we've uh, turned a corner to much more working at home and remotely. Uh, in being transparent and accountable, there's a number of things happening for municipal service excellence, including, um, and I won't mention things I've previously mentioned, but we have our program and services overall review, and that will also set us up for some fee reviews, for example, for uh, planning or um, permits. We've got our sewer use bylaw and our policy for water treatment plant allocation, which is very important for future developments. And I know there's a number of developers who are very interested in that. And we have our new tech agreement, which will lead to the water treatment plant expansion. We have the uh, allocation of our asset sale proceeds and an intention to uh, further engage youth in governance within the municipality. We have the grain terminals next steps being implemented um, and you've given us excellent direction on that tonight. So there's lots of work to, to, to start running on there. Under the growth and prosperity heading, uh, we need to understand our development vision and better communicate uh, the town we want to foster. So that means our updated official plan. When the official plan is done, we want to kick off uh, uh, the comprehensive zoning bylaw update which will then likely uh, um, uh, push, be finalized in 2022, and also a comprehensive parking study uh, that'll look at the need, for example, parking structures or how much parking we'll need within our town, within the current volume context, and also within the context of our uh, accessible transportation intentions. Under the community well-being and sustainability, we've got running our social services roundtable, uh, greenhouse gas benchmarking, the private tree protection bylaw, moving forward with the UN Habitat Pioneer City uh, pilot projects and conference, and there'll be a report back for council direction on those fronts. And working with at least one, and we're hoping more donors on projects, including tree planting and a solar pilot the traffic calming study, a transit study that'll look at buses versus other options as well as routes in the broader regional context, taxi licensing and ride share services, the pilot that the council asked for for the Maple Street North-South link and the cycling plan, a parks visioning and bylaw update to um, uh, pick up when our temporary barbecue ban is uh, uh, is released uh, before the end of this year. Uh, development of a park hierarchy that's very important for our vision on green spaces and will also inform the community benefits uh, development charges. And we have some uh, climate related emergency planning updates that are required as part of our adaptation thinking. And in their arts and culture, there's an art center feasibility study that will uh, carry over into 2021. We hope that it'll be out for uh, uh, bidding this year. And of course, the many items in the diversity and inclusion report. And I'm not going to go through them, you'll be pleased to know, but the last several pages of this report is an update of what we've been calling the pending list which are the items that council has resolved uh, for staff to act on. So that list is also provided. So in summary, I've taken your time to go through that because I believe um, it is an aggressive year. 
um, there's aggressive expectations and intentions and um, nonetheless we as staff are enthused about going forward on um, into that year and I wanted to provide that context because it does relate back to the uh, to the scenarios that we're asking for for the budget. We've uh, listed on page four the proposed criteria that we would use to qualitatively assess and rank um, potential new expenditures. And these includes how much the service would be, the public service would be improved, the number of people that would benefit, um, the length of the benefits, the alignments with the community based strategic plan, risk reduction to the municipality, and finally, staff's capacity to deliver. We don't want to be recommending that you spend money on things that really wouldn't be deliverable under our current uh, staff levels. And finally, the budget planning approach that we are suggesting is a little bit backwards from what you saw last year. And, uh, but I do think that it makes sense. Uh, today you get the priorities and expectations uh, for your comments uh, and, and endorsement. In October, we would uh, update any positional or contextual information. And instead of doing the long list of what every department does, we want to bring forward to you the changes, known unavoidable increase, increases, growth-related increases, or for that matter, decreases if there were some, and any service enhancements. And the motion that we would be looking for next month is that you accept the portions presented for incorporation into the draft budget. And you could sever items, and this wouldn't commit items to be included in the final budget, but it just means they would be retained within the budgeting, budgeting process and still have legs. If you don't like them in October, we don't think you're going to like them in December. In November, we would provide you the full budget out overview with operating and capital and would ask that you endorse it for public consultation. Should you do that, we would spend uh, the majority of November seeking public input um, uh, virtually or if possible in a copy with council that is interactive. Um, and in December, uh, we would review any uh, budget adjustments or public input and ask for your support uh, to bring it forward to uh, December council. And with that, I'll wrap up as having done more than enough talking and uh, turn it back to the chair and your consideration of the proposed motion. Thank you very much, Sonia, for that uh, excellent roadmap. Um, because there is a motion before council, I will be opening this to the public uh, and ask the clerk to see if anyone in our gallery would like to speak to the, that report. Yes, we do, Your Worship. We have Matthew Pretty that would like to speak to this item. Okay, Matthew, uh, go ahead. Uh, we're speaking to the budget uh, process that you've just heard, please. Yes, I understand. And with respect, I just added notes from uh, the pre-budget uh, notes on the PDF, very important. I just want to note how important it is for our town to not get fixated on one cultural uh one cultural group versus the other we are going to see a huge population increase in this area there is a demand for a larger regional population i would like us to consider with the budget traffic calming and public washroom opportunities for our visitors the lineup at tim hortons on first the other day was 25 people at Tim's at 2.30 on Sunday. It was nuts. And like, there's so many people coming up here. Like, I think we need one more light on first, possibly the Niagara Street location, but we got to consider the diversity of population that are interested in moving up here, or really it's a lot of day traffic and, and, and visitors. The Starbucks location at Pine and first is hazardous. I would have to agree with... Uh, our CIO about traffic calming because it is about population and numbers. And I think we've got lots of work to do regarding what those numbers look like and, and also the paid parking. I think that sort of adds a, a level of like location and mapping for the visitors and people that live here. We've got a lot of work to do regarding traffic calming and, uh, 
that stands out the most as well as getting through this COVID-19 degradation of our economic uh, businesses. Uh, it, it is a tough time, and I think we need to keep updating with the Economic Development Group. And, uh, and the meeting like this is super important. This committee meeting is number one. Okay, signing off. I just have one more comment at the end. I'm just going to sign off here. Let's keep working together, guys. We've got big numbers coming in, lots of traffic. Uh, we've got tons to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. All right, Council, uh, any questions or comments on the report before I call the vote? Councillor Jeffrey, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Just really quickly, always to comment that I, I always get some angst when we always uh, do our budget to budget instead of budget to actual. And I know that process comes with some challenges within our process, but there's so many assumptions that we have to make between the budget we did last year uh, that we assumed it would happen and then what did happen and what didn't happen and all those changes. So for me, it gets, um, it gets a little murky. And the other thing that I just wanted to ask is, are we um, won't be going through that list process where we have, uh, I forget what Marjorie calls <laughs> the list, but you know, the, that 2% number goes out into the media. Everybody thinks it's 2% and then council has to go through the list of things that are really desirable or, or whatever from our perspective for the residents. And then it goes up a bit or we use the interest uh, from the, uh, the other money, which we did last year to get through. And then we look like the bad guys. So are we avoiding that whole process this year? C.A.L. Skinner. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Jeffrey. I do think that uh, we are avoiding some of that process this year. Um, we should be, I think, starting with the uh, the two percent on the operating budget. But what will be seen by you know. I mean, the budget's not there yet, but what we're proposing that we provide as a scenario is that the people in town will see a 0% increase in their taxes. So that's what we're starting with. And what we're saying is that we think we can keep the operating um, pieces within 2%, uh, which is also a bit aggressive, uh, but we do think we can, given some of the COVID funding, et cetera, that, uh, that we'll, we're receiving and that the judicial inquiry is going away. So we did design the process so that council wasn't the bad guy um, uh, cutting thing, cutting goodies at the end to get under a certain number, but was able to make a more rational set of decisions early in the process about what they felt was most valuable for the community, which is in part why we wanted to look at the things that you thought were important and give you that chance to ask questions quite early so it didn't come up at the last minute. Follow up? No, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor McLeod, I saw your card up. Thank you. And uh, in response, if I may, uh, to Councillor uh, Jeffrey, as chair of the um, Corporate Community Services Committee, you will find in our next committee, in our next council meeting, in our minutes, uh, reference to some good news that came out of the Treasury Department in our meeting last night, and that is that a new budgeting software uh, has been procured, and uh, that is uh, being that the. Um, Budgetary folks are getting trained on it. We are not ready to use it this year, but it will be prepared and ready for next year. And it does actually include actuals, like up to the minute kind of stuff. So that was uh, very exciting and happy stuff that we heard last night. Provided we get them entered in time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor, uh, any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Councillor Hanlon. Thank you. I just had a comment. I wanted to say thank you so much for the hard work that went into this uh, roadmap and the timeline that set out. I, in the two years I've been on council, it's always been a mystery to me how we get to the day when we're actually approving the budget. And it, anyway, this seems to be very logical. And just thank you for that upfront work. Yeah, I agree. And uh, last year we had a breakthrough in getting the budget passed in the same calendar year. And this year we're improving on that by having our process set out and following that. So it, it, we are continuing the evolution. Uh, any other questions or comments, Council? 
Seeing none, uh, it is moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor McLeod. The Council endorses the budget planning schedule outlined in this document. The Council endorsed the criteria staff will use to quantify or qualitatively assess and rank potential growth and service enhancement expenditures. That staff develop a budget scenario where the 2021 tax rate is the same as the 2020 tax rate. And further, that the operating portion of the 2021 budget be capped at 2% above the 2020 operating budget and any excess will be budgeted into capital, uh, into capital assets, renewal projects, depleted reserves and reserve funds. And with that, I will call the vote. All in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now moving on to the consent agenda. And first we'll put the consent agenda items on the, the table and then if they want to be pulled, you can pull them after we've uh, voted to receive them. So it's moved by Councillor Doherty and seconded uh, by Councillor Berman that the general consent agenda having been given due consideration by the standing committee be received. Uh, there are six items, 6.1 City of Owen Sound support for private members bill M36 Emancipation Day, 6.2 Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing Safe Restart Agreement Municipal Operating Funding, 6.3 Municipal Affairs and Housing Safe Restart Agreement Municipal Transit Funding, 6.4 City of St. Catharines support to City of Toronto in their legal challenge of the amendments made under Bill 184. 6.5 Town of Gore Bay uh, support funding for local social cultural service clubs and youth sporting organizations. 6.6 a Township of Pooslink aggregate resource property valuation. So I will call the vote first and then poll to see if items want to be pulled. So all in favor, Council? That is carried unanimously. Are there any items that uh, would like to be pulled today? Uh, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, 6.2 and 6.3, just for brief comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any others, Council? All right, go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson. Just um, to reiterate again that um, Number one, our premier, for whatever reason, became the number one champion in Canada in terms of uh, making the agreement work with the, the federal government. But all the credit in terms of this funding goes to FCM initiating that $10 billion to $15 billion ask of the federal government and uh, working with the deputy prime minister in terms of getting these um, funds and bilateral agreements in place. So um, I'm very proud of the work. We have a lot of value with our membership in FCM and um, the money that we saw in those letters is phase one. And so that's why the calculations are so important to make sure we include all of our COVID costs uh, to get to phase two funding if we need it. And that's, uh, that's my comment. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jeffrey, and thank you for all your work on the committee uh, and the work with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister in getting us to where we are. And uh, just a reminder to Council members that the FCM voter registration has to be done uh, by September 11. Is that right, Councillor Jeffrey? So uh, I would encourage all of you, please, to uh, register, and the meeting is in October, and we want to make sure that Councillor Jeffrey is returned to advance the interests of Simcoe County and Collingwood. Uh, so if there are no other items or comments, we are now on to 7.1, older deferred business, and we have delayed and deferred contracts. And I understand Director Slam is gonna take us through this. Welcome Peggy, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. So back in May, we staff had provided a list of 2020 capital projects that in staff's perspective were low on the priority list. And we initiated this classification of our capital projects because we knew there would be some limitations due to COVID, but we didn't really know the, what, how, the extent of uh, how those limitations might affect the progress on our projects. So some of those limitations we knew would be staff resources, um, maybe greater priorities such as adapting our operations post-COVID, um, maybe contractor availability or material availability. 
So, and another reason we wanted to identify uh, some projects that could be deferred was to provide possible budget reallocation opportunities for council if su such a decision was needed at the time. So we were unable to give an update in June. And since that time, um, as we pre prepare for the 2021 budget, staff were asked to take a look at the list again and provide an update uh, from a status perspective. So the list uh, that we have today, and I think Chris, you're going to uh, maybe show the list on the screen, please. So this list includes a few more projects which uh, since May have either seen a delay or been deferred for various reasons and I'll, I'll kind of speak to them uh, quickly. If you want to yeah, zoom in Chris you could just zoom in maybe on the um, title of the project for now. So under general government uh, there were some system upgrades and software purchases so these were unable to move forward uh, due to staffing limitations and other priorities. Uh, with respect to the public works building and shop renovations and the town hall refurbishments, uh, facilities needed to uh, focus on adapting our existing buildings for COVID. So these projects will see some progress in 2021, but. Uh, there will be further work expected on these projects in 2021. Under IT, the security monitor, monitoring, um, IT uh, identified early that this would need to be deferred to 2021 due to some other immediate priorities for them. Under transportation, uh, we identified that the third and high intersection project was really a developer driven project and we predicted early that this would not progress in 2020. Um, if you, uh, there was some, you can see some money has been spent in the year to date column, and this is on uh, land acquisition and some early project preparation on the town side for this project. Uh, we had traffic calming and crosswalk infrastructure, and this was been deferred with a delay of the policy development. Also under transit, we've got uh, bus shelters. There was money for an additional bus, bus shelter and this was uh, deferred uh, for 2020. Under PRC, uh, projects like the Arts and Culture Center study, the kick plates and the membership card printer, these were identified early as lower priority projects. Uh, with uh, reduced staff resources, unable to um, work on those. And then some of their capital projects, including their equipment um, allocation, the Sunset Point parking, the Hens and Chick Trail, and the Harborview Boardwalk, those capital projects saw some progress, but again, we'll see some carryover of these projects into 2021. And in some cases, uh, we know that this is due to a shortage of materials. Uh, that we're seeing um, in these COVID times. Under the library, the accessible entrance doors, uh, this project um, saw some progress or we'll see some progress in 2020, but we won't see the installation of the doors until 2021. Under wastewater, uh, there was an allocation for some general asset replacement at the sewage pump station locations. And uh, this work was deferred just to other priorities um, identified at the wastewater treatment plant and some re reduced staffing resources. And under water, uh, we have a category for meter replacement. And this was also identified early as uh, it, wouldn't, it would be lower on the priority because it does require the uh, meter technician going into homes. And in COVID times, we, we have just done this in, on an emergency basis. So that's just kind of a, a quick uh, breakdown um, and uh, finance has provided what the, um, the budget allocations were and what has been spent to date. And also, again, the list does identify some of these projects you'll see um, carried over and included uh, or some portion of them included in the 2021 budget. If there's any questions, I can try to answer them, or maybe some of the other directors might be able to provide some insight. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, Council, any questions or comments on uh, Director Slama's report? 
Looks like you covered all the bases, Peggy. Thank you very much. This brings us to uh, item eight, which is public delegations. And I'll look to the clerk. Uh, Sarah, is there anyone in our gallery who would like to uh, make a delegation knowing that they have uh, five minutes to speak on any topic that was heard tonight or any other that they feel is relevant? Uh, yes, Your Worship, we do have Matthew Pretty that would like to have one last comment. All right, Matthew, go ahead. You've got five minutes. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna go walk here and start the front here of the house. I would like to propose an additional interest in ecology preservation when we look at share the road and boardwalk and active transportation. I found a turtle at the labyrinth the other day and I moved it, put it in the water. There's a lady making a video of it and I found a dead one unfortunately on the shoreline path from boardwalk to that little beach along the shore side of labyrinth. I would please like to ask town council to consider more of an ecology based preservation when it comes to trail and trail expansion. I would like to propose a boardwalk at that site that protects and and raises up a pathway for these this turtle nesting area. There are snapping turtles at that site. I've saw two. I've got a sample in the freezer right now in a jar, the one that I found dead, crushed by someone on a bike or walking. They're beautiful little things. Um, can we please get a more of an ecology-based perspective? We've got that indigenous slogan at the start of town council. I just think we're missing one side when we're dealing with preparing budgets and things. And again, traffic calming, parking, like look at, you know, Bud Powell's uh, recommendation about the Niagara Street shoreline. That's a huge risk as well. There's a fellow from Share the Road at the, the boat dock the other day and I was chatting with him, saw his photo. He says, yeah, we're going to do a rock wall style path you got to be careful on that section of secret trail and again this goes out to engineering peggy slammer regarding a significant wall at the highway 26 area where that swamp is that's going to go over the the edge there onto the road across from park bridge so that needs immediate attention i would say flood retention ecology preservation activities needs to be priority number one with regards to storm surges. That's all I have to say today. I really think, guys, we need to think about the ecology and, and both, like, say, these snapping turtles at, at Labyrinth. Let's put some money into that. You know, widening the berm over by Hen and Chicken's Path. That's got to be widened. I was sitting there at the end of winter. It's eroding. And along the highway, and... Uh, and the health and well-being of the town, the, the Mr. Larry Law, what a guy, having the out of the cold at the Cranberry Village. I can't even believe he offered that. And I hear good things. I know people at Tim Hortons. I talk with them, and, and they're actually getting help they need. It's a game changer. And we should focus on that aspect of the medical crisis as well as reaching out to people on an ongoing basis, maintenance, prevention of ill health, talking about maintenance and I just want to say to everyone it's it's been a, a shocking year I had no idea this was going to happen and we need to maintain essential perspective of both engineering and our overall health in the community and uh, that's all I have to say I just want to say thank you and, and I'm trying to tone down my rhetoric as you know I have some extremist views and I just want to get practical with town council and, and we need to see the light of, of our residents and, and what we can do to offer calm in this storm, the 316 closure. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, right. thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor okay. Saunderson. Thank you for your comments, and they're noted, and we will look at that. And uh, That's excellent. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Yeah. Sarah, do we have anyone else from the gallery that would like to make a comment? All right, then that brings us to our notice of adjournment. Councillor Jeffrey, all in favor? 
We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Now we have our special meeting. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that we reconvene at uh, 20 to 8. Okay, so we'll see you at 28. Thanks, everyone.